Good morning. This is Christopher Decker, your host of the Eureka Moments Only podcast, where we share the breakthroughs and the aha moments of entrepreneurs and thought leaders around the world. Please welcome our guest, Nick Reed, an Oscar-winning documentary film producer, digital transformation expert, creator of the most shared and engaging content in the world. He's worked for Pepsi, AT&T, the Global Olympics, Hyundai, Pizza Hut, and many high-level influencers like Cristiano Ronaldo. Thank you, Nick, for coming on the show today. You're very welcome. Great to catch up with you again. Tell us more about yourself. What's your story? Um, well, what I hope people might be interested in this on this podcast is that um, I now live in the world of digital. Um, I am busier now than I've ever been. And basically... What I do is I create relationships for brands. So what I do is I basically go out, find you people that are interested in what you're doing, tell them why they should be interested in what you're doing, and then basically put the two together. So basically, I'm a, I'm a relationship counselor uh, for brands and consumers. And of course, my medium uh, is every, you know, pretty much every social platform that you've heard of that is, that is uh, mass. Um, basically, I help messaging and connecting the dots to people. Um, I got into this through a, a bunch of different things. So um, when I was young, I was a pilot in the Navy, flying uh, airplanes and helicopters a little bit. Um, then I got into um, the kind of the direct marketing business when the, the you guys won't remember, but these, these little apples that used to sit on your desk and it was the beginning of direct marketing. And within a year and a half, that company uh, was the runner at best new business of the year. Um, and then I found myself... Uh, getting into public relations and, and advertising on a bigger scale. Um, and then basically on my 28th birthday, I decided when I was 17, 18, that one day I wanted to live in Australia or California, that I wanted to um, basically take my life seriously. So I moved to LA on my 28th birthday. And within two years of being in America, I was cast by Steven Spielberg to play Robin Williams' father. I worked with Francis Ford Coppola and Gary Oldman on the movie Dracula with Keanu Reeves when I had a writer. And the other crazy thing was I got cast by Adidas to be a leg model. And my legs appeared on uh, billboards all over America, which was quite <laughs> hilarious. Um, but that found me in the film business. And I didn't really respond to being an actor because I'm not very good at sitting there and waiting for things to happen. I like to make things happen. And I realized that movies, just like advertising, was very conceptual. And my great kind of insight at that time was I just didn't understand why people weren't doing franchises because in advertising, if you have Kellogg's and people love Kellogg's, you do different sizes, you do it with strawberry flakes, you do travel, you know, travel family sizes, you make the most of something that you love. Um, but in movies, very, very few franchises. There was James Bond, and I think it was The Lethal Weapon, but very few franchises. So I basically decided that I was going to specialize in franchise films because it's so hard to get a movie made. Why wouldn't you make more of them? Um, so I've been involved in movies from uh, Born Identity, Bridget Jones' Diary, uh, Austin Powers, Meet the Parents, Resident Evil, Underworld. Uh, so as you can see, uh, probably half my business was franchise pictures, which basically meant that my clients went to work regularly. Uh, their, their salaries doubled regularly. Um, and it was all from that kind of one, that one insight, which is I just didn't understand why that wasn't a focus. Um, about seven years ago, uh, for some bizarre reason, my insight that came to me was I just felt like the mobile phone was going to be the most powerful device in the world. And seven years ago, people thought I was crazy because YouTube had just started. People were like, oh, no one's going to watch content on their phone. No one's going to watch a film on their phone. And I foolishly or smartly set up a company specializing on online video. And coming from $200 million blockbuster films like Born Identity to... YouTube videos, pretty much everyone that I knew thought I was crazy. Um, about 18 months later, um, we had done this uh, project for Turkish Airlines with um, uh, Lionel Messi uh, and it was um, uh, Kobe Bryant, which was this massive, massive hit. And all of a sudden I went from being crazy to brilliant. So fast forward to now, um, we work for some of the biggest brands in the world. And what we do really is digital strategy and we do storytelling. Um, and as we all know, you know, storytelling is mankind or humankind's advantage over um, everybody. So the question becomes is in a, in a world where you have so much stuff coming at you, so many platforms, how do you get someone to stop? 
take notice of what you want to talk about and then build a relationship with them. And then, of course, you want them to become a customer. So very simple to say, but very, very hard to do. Um, and what's happening right now for us is that we have so many huge traditional brands who can't sell product because so much of the retail space is closed. And everyone is now like, okay, well, I know I need to do more digital. Now they have no choice. So the notion that we're all digitally connected is basically, it's almost like accelerated that conversation by two years, I would say. So that's what I do. I basically create, find and create communities for brands of people that might like their product, nurture that relationship and help them basically come into the funnel to be a fan of, of that brand. So we're in an extremely unique situation economically in our society, politically, everything across the board has been shaken up by this COVID-19 situation. How, how are we supposed to build a business and, and drive and drive business? Now you've been touching on this a little bit uh, with digital, but is what's, what's working right now? Well, so the question that I always ask everybody is why do I care? So if you're selling a car, if you're selling me clothing, whatever it is you're selling, the question becomes, why do I care? And if you can tell me why I should care and, and you do a good job, now you've kind of created a conversation. So to me, what this does is really make you go very introspective and ask yourself, the product or the service that I'm offering, why does anybody care? And of course, sometimes you can come to that quite quickly. Other times it's quite difficult, but to me, unless you can create value in your communication and you're just, I think of it just like a, a, a normal human relationship. If I can give you advice and, and good ideas on a regular basis, you go, oh, I like Nick, you know, I, I want to do something with him. It's exactly the same in communication. The kind of the, the days of advertising where brands are shouting at you through a megaphone saying we're great by our product is obviously, you know, going down rapidly. There's still a place for advertising. But I think much more you need to care about your customers. And also audience segmentation is such now that there are certain customers that will like one thing, like women will like a certain type of brand or certain color, and men would like something else. So sending men the same conversation that I would have with women is kind of a, a waste. So what social allows you to do is have very specific conversations with very specific groups. But the question comes back to, what is it that I have that is of value to you, right? And how do I tell you that without selling it to you? How do I understand what you're going through? How do I understand your issues? And how do I then say, hey, this might help you. But unless you can find out what it is that you stand for and what your value is, it becomes very difficult. So it, you, your messaging is more tailored to the, the person and and what they're more receptive to versus that single megaphone to a large group of people. Now, how do you start to craft the right, the right message for the right person? Well, so there are a lot of things that are um, common to all of us, regardless of culture, regardless of age. So sports is one of them, for example, right? There are sports fans from the age of seven to 77, and they are thematically interested in sports so you've got this one mass group there okay so that's actually not to do with demographics that's around interests um you know if you think about all the self-help stuff going on diets you know uh, tony robbins coaching there are a lot of thematics that we all want to be better for, about ourselves so you start off with are there some macro themes that we can use or there are some micro themes so if you go into sports for example uh are you a sports fan me, esports, e so <laughs> video games. <laughs> so, so let's say your age group and people with your interests are my audience, right? So you are, my, you are the customers we want to try and connect to. Mm -hmm. well, we'll go, well, everyone loves esports. So now what we have to do is go, okay, well, if I want to stop you in the street and I don't know who you are, if I stopped you in the street and said, hey, Christopher, do you want to buy a T-shirt? You would go, leave me alone or you keep walking, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm like, hey, man, do, do you like esports? You go, what? I say, yeah, do you love esports? You've got that look about you. And you go, yeah, I do. Now I can have a conversation with you about esports. And the fact that I was a stranger 20 seconds ago has just left your mind 
because we're now conversing about something that we both have an interest in, right? Same tribe, right? Right. So now, so what I'm saying is, hey, I have your same interests. I, I have your same values. Um, and now I'm purely talking to you about something you're interested in, right? I'm not going to come out and sell you the shirt. And at the end of our conversation, I'm going, Christopher, that was incredible, Matt. I got to run. But hey, can we get together, have coffee? We get together a week later, we talk about esports. And at the end of it, I'm like, dude, you know what? I got the perfect shirt for you to wear when you're, when you're gaming. You go, mm-hmm. well, let me see it. So it's about finding that relationship and how you treat it. And I think for me, in most forms of advertising or marketing, people rush in and try and sell you something without really saying, hey, Christopher, how's your day going? You know, there's not that kind of common civility. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong on digital, which is they just rush in with the offer and they don't know whether you're the right person. Um, they even, even haven't said hello to you and they haven't found a common interest. So if you want to build a community, right? And now I'm just going to say we're in the shirt business, right? Mm-hmm. But if I can build a community of gamers, people that love football, now I've got these people that I'm sharing information with about something we care about. And out of that passion comes the fact that I have these incredible shirts. And the reason I'm making the shirt is because I'm passionate about the subject, right? And I speak the same language. So it's kind of, I, I think to me, it's differentiating someone who is trying to sell you something with someone who has a passion and a value for what they do. I don't know if that answers the question. You're tapping into the passion and the value and the the, the common sensibilities and uh, do you agree that that's kind of tapping into to empathy a little bit, really seeing people where they are? Well, I think that there's a bunch of emotions, right? So for us, when we make uh, content, so, so basically what we do is we develop a strategy. And then when you have a strategy that you agree on, then you've got to go, okay, well, that's great. Now, how do I stop people? So, mm-hmm. so we're famous for quote unquote making hero videos that have got, you know, 100 million views, um, but what we really care about is the engagement, right? So the engagement numbers of our work is kind of 10 to 50 times the average video because for us, a view is kind of worthless to some extent. What really matters is who actually stops and makes a comment, who shares it, right? That's, you know, even even clicking on it, you know, saying you like it, but we want someone to engage because without engagement, no one's listening is the way I look at it, right? So unless someone engages, they're not listening. So why go any further, you know? And emotionally, you know, the things that people respond to, they love humor, they love awe, right? And, you know, and, and empathy is one of those kind of, uh, kind of comes into, comes into play several times, right? You make someone cry with joy, um, you make them laugh, you inspire them. So you're looking for those emotions that actually make you connect to the story that's being told. And if you can connect emotionally, that to us is the money, right? So to your point, if you can connect emotionally in whatever you're saying, now you have a connection. And once you have a connection, people are listening. Now, if you don't abuse that connection and you explain why you have a, something of value, now to me, you have a chance to build a community. So we're starting to uncover a formula here. It sounds like sort of coming from the heart and then matching you at the tribal level, at the value level, and then not abusing that new trust that you've built and not going in for the sale immediately because that might be. I don't, know, I don't know if that's unethical or what it really boils down to, but it's just people are just going to run away from that. So how do you tactfully get to the point that you're asking someone to buy something? Um, about seven, eight years ago, I met a bunch of really great young guys out of Utah and they showed me this video and it was a bunch of young people on a, a little yacht in a lake and they were jumping into the water onto this inflatable kind of like seesaw. And it was amazing, right? And I'm watching it, and I'm like, this is phenomenal. Like, what are we advertising, right? And he goes, it's a music video. So as opposed to the band playing the instruments, you saw this video. It was young people having an amazing time. The music, halfway through, you were kind of you know, nodding your head. It was amazing. And they sold like 100,000 downloads of the song. So it, sometimes you know, you're selling by not selling, you know? Mm. Um, in the case of a brand, of course, you can have a link. So I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any call to action. I'm just saying you don't come out and say, hey, you want to buy a shirt? <laughs> right? 
you start off with something that's happened in, you know, in, in, in gaming, right, that you're interested in, that gets your attention, that makes you smile, that makes you laugh. Mm-hmm. Now I've kind of broached the subject. Now I can slowly lead to that. So the question becomes, how strongly do you do that? And that depends on the product. It depends on the price. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if it's a big, big price, small price, all those things come into play. But the notion is, let's start with, how is your day going? You know, I love e-gaming too. Right, because now you're listening to me, uh, but now I decide how long is that conversation before I say, "By the way, awesome shirts." I have a challenge for you. So, th- this show we talk about eureka moments, the breakthroughs, realizations. So, do, if you had any new realizations, as you've had some time, you, you may, you know, you're either slowing down or you're speeding up right now. But I think there's only two categories for how people are reacting to, to COVID and, and, and their work life. And it sounds like you're speeding up, but have you had any, have you had any new breakthroughs? Um, new breakthroughs. Um, I think actually the breakthrough that I've had is really the breakthrough that I think we've all had which is this experience has really made you rethink lifestyle. And I mean that in terms of, do you drive to the office? Do you stay at home? Mm -hmm. Uh, If you don't drive to the office every day, now the question is, well, maybe I can live further away because now I've only got to commute two days a week. So now maybe I'm going to live further out and get a nicer house. Um, If I can have great digital connection, you know, can I do that when I'm traveling? So I, I think that, you know, we've all experienced, uh, you know, I have two kids, one lives with me, one is in London, um, but it's completely rejiggered how you interact with people. I mean, for me, uh, I've done more cooking than I've ever done before. Um, <laughs> you know, I've done more hanging out with friends on, on video calls than I've ever done before. And I think, for, if anything, for me, the, the, the notion is that we are actually uh, freer than we thought we were. You know, mm. I think all of us were... Uh, you know, in Holland years ago when I was a young, young man, I, I lived there for a while. And what I loved about the Dutch is I said, you know, they basically, they work to live, not live to work. Mm-hmm. Um, I think to some extent what this, is, this period has done for me is really that. So I would say it's less about a, a work uh, revolution, but I would say in terms of, you know, when the way back in the day when um, – the blue BlackBerry was a, was a device that you know everyone in business had. What I loved about that was I was able to go on holiday with my children, and I could spend forty five minutes twice a day working and go back to my holiday. So instead of going away stressing or not going away, I, I was able to use the tool in a way that it gave me freedom as opposed to being trapped. Mm-hmm. And I think what's happened today has been a recalibration of that, which is I think we need to embrace what technology can do for us and try and reverse the tables a little bit. So I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but I think when you when I think about how I how that makes me feel, I think about when I'm trying to um, communicate with people how I can use those thematics because people I think are more ready to change now than they've ever changed ever because they're in a situation where they have to, and as you know, changing people's behavioral patterns is very very difficult. Yes, it is very difficult, and. You had, I don't know, the last comparable thing that I lived through was the 2008-2010 thing where, I don't know, according to the movies, a bunch of people made a bunch of money in real estate and screwed over a nation. But but you look at the companies that came out of, of, of that, that became really successful, all the billion dollar companies, all the new wealth created. You had the, the Airbnbs, you had the Ubers, which was taking something that existed in real life, IRL, and then adding technology on top of it and then just kind of fully trusting that. So versus maybe this is just a hypothesis that I have. And I think yours, you might be supporting this a little bit is that instead of just blatantly trusting technology to, to take over and disrupt things, we almost have to rehumanize the tech that we've given too much over to. And, you know, to have that opportunity to work, to live versus live to work I mean, that, that's a major shift in humanity, right? <laughs> yeah, I also think that, you know, um, when there are trends, they always are always overdone, right? So the, the pendulum always swings too, too heavy and then swings back too far. 
Yeah. And I think that in the tech world, so many people were launching businesses, raising money uh, on things that weren't fully thought out. And now I think what happens is that if you have a really good business model, you're going to survive. If you don't have a really good business model, you don't. And I think that um, it kind of re- it reconnect it rejiggers everybody's thinking because obviously right now a lot of young people are doing incredible dynamic stuff and they've never experienced some of those ups and downs of those older people. Um, and I think it's just about if you understand what has happened, I'm a huge kind of, I love history because to me history pretty much repeats itself. The question mm-hmm. on what kind of cycle and what kind of level and, and where it appears. Um, but I think it's a great re it's a great reset for all of us. I think, I think it's, it's reset what's important to us. So coming out of this, what do you spend money on? Right? So if you're a brand now, where do you fit? Are you a luxury? Are you a staple? Are you a must have, you know, so where you sit in the chain of importance now matters. And I think actually your messaging to people is more important. I think people's hearts have been opened by this, right? So many people have done so many amazing things. Mm-hmm. And I think what happens is those companies, if you take Lysol, for example, you know, they didn't double, triple the price of their products like some perhaps big pharma companies may or may not have, you know, would do. They stayed true. And I think mm-hmm. the trust level that that brand has got, for example, has gone up massively, right? Because you go, they were, they were there, they're really important, and they, didn't, they basically didn't go out and gouge me, right? So you have a feeling of relationship. Mm-hmm. So I think that how you look at brands that you – you buy changes, I think. And I, and I think that one of the things that digital has and does not have at the same time is trust, right? It's like what's so powerful about uh, digital is people can attack you with messages and those messages can slightly change over time mm-hmm. and they can take you somewhere. So if I said something to you now that was kind of quite crazy, you'd go, Nick, you're crazy. But if over the next six months I delivered messages to you kind of just pointing you in the direction of where I want to be crazy about. And I just Uh nudge you a little bit every week. You know, in six months' time, when I tell you my crazy idea, you go, oh, that kind of makes sense. So I think the problem with being saturated in in digital Uh is that people have the ability to segment you, kind of get an understanding of who you are behaviorally by based on what you do, what you buy, and things like that. The problem is, you know, as we all know, there's too much information about us out there. Um, and it means if you're really, really smart, right, you can create uh, rifts. You know, if you're a Republican or a Democrat right now, if you don't like Trump, you don't see any of the press that says Trump is amazing. You know, mm-hmm. if you uh, don't love Trump, that's all you see. So already so much of the, the information that we see uh, is completely contaminated because it's coming to us because of what we believe in. And I think the hardest thing today is where do you get really good information that you can trust that doesn't have a point of view and i think what happens is if you're a brand that also has merit too because you're in this place where you don't you don't want to have a side per view but you want to be very pro value and and i think very pro human uh, human value wow okay that's a lot so we we have a little we have a few things to unpack here and i think what you mentioned about what you see what you believe is incredibly important and I'm going to relate this to a a man that you mentioned earlier in this episode, Tony Robbins. And I think he spent his whole career helping people break through beliefs that maybe weren't even planted there by themselves. They they came from outside sources. Um, And and you kind of take, you take charge and you create new beliefs that are empowering instead of limiting you and shutting you down. So is, do do you feel that on, on a consumer level, um, people may be so reinforced in these beliefs that there's no way out. There's no way to restructure your environment. Is there, I mean, how do you break out of this if there's so much money being spent to keep you in a box? I know it's a tough question, but I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so when the internet started, it was exciting because it was a flat world, right? Everyone could do anything. And then what happened is these big monoliths, uh, Google, Amazon, Apple, started to kind of own the internet, and then the kind of the walls went up. Um, you know, just looking at search, right? It's like, how do you win against a, a big company? Um, but because big companies have investors and boards of directors and, and multiple, multiple levels, or layers rather, mm-hmm. uh, they can't move quickly. 
And the other thing is if they've got a business practice that's working, even if you've got some visionary CEO who says, I can see a cliff coming in three years' time, we need to pivot, saying goodbye to that money is tricky, right? You know, in the same way people said, why give amazing product to Netflix? Well, one division of the studio is making a lot of money doing these incredible licensing deals to Netflix, right? Mm-hmm. The other division was saying, hang on, they're competing with our, with our revenue. So mm-hmm. this, can, this continues all the time. So I think at the end of the day, disruption's always been there. I think that the importance of human value, I truly believe that brands can no longer be uncaring about how they treat the resources that they take for their product, that the people they look after. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, I think the storytelling is so powerful. And if you think about it, the rise of influencers basically influences our storytellers, right? Even if you're doing dance videos on TikTok, right, you are telling a story that, that, um, that engages people. So the question then becomes is if you can tell a story and engage people, how do you now add a layer of nuance to get your brand story out there or what it is you stand for, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that um, it just means lock into your audience, figure out what your value is, and, and find out why people should buy your product or buy your service. And if you can find that core value, now you just have to be the best storyteller you can, right? And if you really are giving value and your pricing makes sense, um, now it's just a matter of getting the word out there. And, and you know, the reason that... Um, we've become successful as we got known for making the biggest viral videos ever. So the way we look at it is that one of the most powerful forms of marketing is word of mouth. If I say to you, Chris, there's an amazing Italian restaurant down the street, there's a pretty good chance, maybe 50, 50, maybe better that you might check it out Uh because I, because you know, I love it. So when you create a story and you create a video and it, it connects to you, you go, Oh my God, I'm going to share that with my friends, my mom, my, you know, your, your kind of related network. What's happening is that's basically word of mouth at scale, right? So this messaging that I've given you that you've kind of really connected to in some way, you're sharing it on your Facebook page or you're, you're sharing it out um, on Twitter or however you, you've seen it. You basically have become the brand ambassador for my product, you know, for my service. So, it's, so the way we look at it is virality through storytelling one done right is basically word of mouth at scale. And there's nothing more powerful than that. So there's, I mean, I, I guess the question I have to ask, and then I, and then I have a, um, another question I want to ask you to sort of uh, bring this all together. Is, is virality something that can be engineered or is there an element of chance there? I'm, I'm really curious as to your thoughts. Um, well, the answer is it can be manufactured. I mean, that's what we do. I mean, we've made now, I think we've had 52 global hits. Um, there's an incredible, a lot of work goes into it. I mean, listening, um, getting information and listening to your audience, what they do, what they care about, what they watch. These are all things that we bring into account. And I I would say basically a successful video that gets a lot of attention needs two things in general. One of them is it needs to have a great concept and story that is relevant to your audience and timely. And the second thing is it needs to have an amazing marketing distribution plan because without a marketing distribution plan, your video will never get seen. Mm-hmm. And without a great video, the marketing distribution plan doesn't matter because the video is rubbish. So, of course, there are uh, people that get lucky through a variety of reasons, but quite often it's because they hit the right messaging at the right timing and it sparks everyone's interest and people share it. Um, but yes, if you have time, you have resources, you can basically create viral videos time and time again uh, because the thing about social is it allows you to test your messaging. So before we launch a campaign, we'll have already tested it. We'll already know how it does. So before we add the gasoline to the fire, we already know that the fire is working. Um, advertising, you go launch your stuff on television, you spend you know, your big Super Bowl spots and it works or it doesn't work. For us, we do all our work online, we test it, we know that it works, so then when we launch, we already know it's a success. Um, so the answer is why is it always successful is because we test it, make changes, iterate, test, iterate, test, iterate, test, and then when the results are great, we go, okay, now we're ready to launch. And then of course we have to worry about how, when, timing, just like launching a rocket 
you know, from uh, into space. There's so many things that have to happen in a certain sequence, but you can basically get it into space every single time. So that that's a very scientific based approach. And I, I mean, do you lean more into personally the art side or the science side, or or is it more of a combination for you? Uh, great question. So I'm an Academy Award winning documentary filmmaker. My head of creative is an Oscar nominated filmmaker. And we will both tell you the same thing. We are a science company that uses art. Because um, if you, to give you an analogy, if you say to me, Nick, I, I need you to go into a room with a dart and I need you to go get me a customer. I walk in the room. I'm basically, I have no idea where the customer is, right? What the science allows you to do is say, okay, Christopher, the dartboard is on that wall over there. It's a little bit near the corner. It's about four foot off the ground. That's where it is. So now I stand in the middle of the room with my dart. Now I can't promise you I can hit the bullseye every single time, but I can promise you I will hit the dartboard. And I can promise you I'm quite a good dart player. So I promise you it's going to be pretty good, right? So science basically allows you through to get data and information to tell you how to address your target, where your target is. So for us, we will always be successful. The only question is, is it super successful? Is it a unicorn? But I know that I'm going to hit the target. and I know I'm going to be successful. That is a very clear visual. And I'm really, I'm really grateful you shared that because I think that clears up a lot of things for people that are listening to this, the entrepreneurs in the room, the creative people in the room. Who are wondering what what comes first? Is it the creative or is it the science? But, but it's 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 both. So the 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 thing that I want to ask you to kind of wrap this up is is if you could write a letter to yourself ten years from now, what would you say? Um, as I've got older, I've got more and more uh, spiritual, and I had such a blessed life. I look back at my you know fifteen careers that I've had. And I think in, in uh, I think basically what it would say is uh, trust yourself more. I think that um, one of the blessings I've had because my father was in the Navy, so I grew up as a child, always moving every couple of years. Uh, change is hard for all of us. And I think the one thing I was blessed to have was the fact that change is, inev- is, is going to happen all the time. It's inevitable and it's good. And I think I wish I had um, just trusted myself more and worried less. And I think to some extent, if you are, this might sound a little hokey, but I really think that if you're a good person, have good values, um, and that you try and put good into the world, I truly believe in karma. And I think that you just have to trust. Um, so many things have gone wrong for me, as I'm sure they've gone wrong for so many of the, of the listeners. But cut to a year or two, or even three years, four years later, something amazing has happened that never would have happened had that thing not happened. So today, uh, when something goes wrong, instead of getting upset and annoyed, the first question I ask myself is, what is the universe trying to tell me? Right? Something is not right. And I try and think of it in a, in a positive manner rather than a negative manner. So mm-hmm. I think for me, as a, you know, 10 years ago or even younger, it's like, and I've had experiences where I've overcome obstacle after obstacle after obstacle to make something happen, only, only for it to be something that was so miserable I, I, got, I got out of the business. But I think it's trust yourself and, and trust that when things don't happen the way that you think they happen, just take a second and go, okay, maybe that is a sign. Right Now, the tricky bit is if it's one thing, maybe you're still on track. But if you keep getting things keep turning up and are not going your way, I really do believe that's the universe trying to help you. So uh, trust yourself. And if a couple of things keep going wrong, maybe ask yourself the question, is someone trying to tell me something? Wow. Wow. Thank you, Nick. What an amazing way to, to wrap up this, this, this episode. For those of you listening, I've been on this Zoom call with Nick. And he has this virtual background standing next to Elon. Those of you who are watching have been asking the same question I'm asking. How, what, what's going on there? <laughs> um, I just had a mutual friend. Um, we went out to dinner. Um, he is 
you know, like everyone knows, he is one of the most fascinating, open people I've ever met. And I think that one of the things that I think is so fantastic um, about his philosophy is that he will listen to absolutely anybody about anything. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things we've tried very hard at my company, uh, Shareability, to do is that when we have projects, everybody is invited into the room because um, a 14-year-old, a 20-year-old, uh, someone from a different country, like an amazing idea is an amazing idea. And I think that openness to change um, and just being open to good ideas from wherever they come is key. And I just think that he, for me, is someone who is really pushing forward. I mean, you can argue about everything about, I mean, no one agrees with everybody all the time. And some people can say he's, you know, he's a bit crazy or he's a genius. But I think that anyone that puts himself in the way of massive change, like going up against huge, um, you know, NASA and rocket projects and military contracts, uh, car companies, someone who believes in actually trying to move the whole planet forward is unbelievable. Um, and I think that to me, he gets so many passes for that thing. And I think in a world where everyone is just scared and fearful, um, standing up and, and, you know, making change is such a, such an incredible thing. So uh, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan. And again, I think, you know, my last comment would be, be open to everybody. When you have an idea, pitch it to your kids, pitch it to your friends. I mean, pitch it to people you don't know. Because at the end of the day, if you pitch 10 people your idea and they all look at you like you're crazy, well, maybe it's not a good idea. You know, I think, you know, and if they all come back and say, hey, that's kind of cool. I mean, I wouldn't buy it, but it's kind of cool. Maybe you've mm -hmm. got something. So I, I would say if you believe in what you're doing and you think you're doing something great, go tell people. And if this is, these are strangers, you know, hopefully when we get back to normal in Starbucks in the line when you're waiting, just say, hey, would you buy a T-shirt for 25 bucks if it had this thing on it? It goes, oh, man, that seems like, you know, just listen to people. And I think that that openness is what can get everybody a long way. So if we wanted to listen to you, we wanted to follow your journey, social, wherever, where do we go? How do we find your work? What do we do? Um, if you go to shareability.com, uh, you'll see some of our videos that have, you know, basically broken records. We've created the most shared videos in the world now for the last seven years. Um, but think about it like this. Even though when you see something successful, like the Nike Just Do It, you know, or, or the work that we do with Cristiano Ronaldo or, or AT&T, you go, well, that's amazing, but it's, it's like an iceberg. What you're seeing is the tip of the iceberg, but underneath the water, there's a lot of science, there's a lot of testing, uh, there's a lot of things that make it that, you know. And in Hollywood, coming out of Hollywood, you know, so many people joke, um, you know, someone becomes a movie star, oh, they're an overnight sensation. Well, it's taken them 20 years to become an overnight sensation. And I think when you look at stuff and you go, wow, I love that. It's successful. Ask yourself why. It's because something in that work connects to you, right? You connect to it for some reason. That's what makes that work great. So I come back to the beginning of our conversation, which is what is it that you do that gives value and why do I care? Man, thank you so much, Nick Reed, for becoming um opening us up to your world for joining the eureka moments only podcast family and for dropping a lot of amazing wisdom and knowledge today what does the shirt say death is inevitable <laughs> but, oh, but you can live but you can live a life you're proud of <laughs>